Hi, I wanted to quickly review some of the stuff from uh, class on the 10th of uh, July. Um, I introduced, kind of discussed again, um, the general framework that we're using for thinking about um, papers. So first of all, we start with what is the question and what are the different theories that they're thinking about? What are some of the sort of invisible processes going on that they're trying to um, figure out which one is most likely or is best supported by um, their experiment. Um, and then they start to design their experiments. So that involves having comparison groups. That either means um, that they're just comparing between sort of naturally occurring differences, for example, some people with the disease versus some people without, um, or they're actually um, changing something, maybe um, uh, giving half of the people um, a particular treatment and other half not getting the treatment. Um, or they have um, uh, animals where they're um, mutating a gene or altering activity in the brain somehow, um, and then looking to see what the consequences of that are. Um, and then they start measuring, uh, uh, measuring something. So those measurements could be behavioral measurements. Those measurements could be um, activity in the brain, could be something that they're measuring um, in addition to something that they might have manipulated. Um, they might measure um, uh, symptoms um, or, or um, a lot of different things. We'll kind of work through a lot of different uh, versions of this as we keep building up uh, the different papers that we're looking at. Um, and then uh, once you've got the, the methods here, your comparison groups and manipulations, and then plan about what you're going to measure, then you return to the questions and theories and say, what are, you know, for each of those possible theories, what result would I expect? And for these results, um, we want them to have um, a very particular format of, if this theory is correct, um, then I expect to reserve, observe this visible result. And because of this sort of internal process going on. Um, so for example, with the Chamberlain paper, the first part of the study that we talked about, um, uh, you know, our, our idea is um, if the um, uh, orbital frontal cortex is suppressing compulsions in healthy people, um, then we observe to see less activity during task switching in obsessive compulsive behaviors because the orbital frontal cortex in people with OCD um, is not able to suppress habitual compulsive behaviors. Um, and then once we've got our sort of if then because for each of these, then we go and actually do the experiment, see which results we get, then figure out how does that line up, and then, um, and then we essentially select one of our results and say, well, um, we observed X, um, and that, and so inside the brain, we're guessing this invisible process is going on. Um, and, uh, and so we conclude um, one of the theories. So um, we observe less activity during task switching. And then, um, so we sort of take our, uh, take our um, result, then our because from before, which is, um, so inside the brain, something th this invisible process must be going on um and then um and then uh the the um and then so our overall sort of theory is so or so orbital frontal cortex uh is involved in um uh suppressing compulsive behavior so so you know um, our result is we observe less activity our conclusion is less activity indicates that the orbital frontal cortex is involved in suppressing compulsive behaviors um because, uh, or rather, um, and so and so overall, we conclude that um, uh, that that that's the main consequence in obsessive compulsive disorder. To spell this out a little bit, we went through a lot of information about the Chamberlain study. Their first question, just about how OCD um, is uh, how orbital frontal activity is different in people with OCD versus controls. Um, and so uh, we talked about um, a couple of different possible theories that the orbital frontal cortex um, uh, uh, either might always be overactive, which is what was found in the previous study, um, or the orbital frontal cortex might become less active and that that indicates the person can't stop the behavior. Um, we had our comparisons of OCD versus controls. We measured brain activity. Um, and, then the and then the predictions with the theory are if the orbital frontal cortex is always overactive, then OCD will... Um, uh, have higher orbital frontal cortex, and then in that case, our invisible, our invisible interpretation is they're always obsessing. Um, 
there could be other things, um, or maybe they 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 um, they uh, keep coming back to the behaviors. Um, and then our second theory was if the orbital frontex is is uh, is sort of is shut down, then OCD we'd expect to have less activity because the orbital frontex cortex is stopping compulsion. So that's the invisible thing. The orbital frontex cortex is stopping compulsions in healthy people, and that that function is failing in OCD or is less active in OCD. Our result was less activity, and then so our conclusion is this underactivity. And for some papers, we'll also go a little bit further on and think about, well, what's the next experiment that we might want to do? Maybe we want to compare people with OCD while they're having severe symptoms versus people with OCD whose maybe their OCD is in remission or something like that at that point in time. Um, the second part of the Chamberlain study was looking at the siblings and other uh, close relatives who do not have OCD. Um, and so for that, we had also two possible theories. Um, one is that um, genes might cause a risk of OCD, and then only in some people who have that genetic risk does the risk does the genetics manifest as symptoms, and the orbital frontal cortex dysfunction only happens during um, OCD. So orbital frontal cortex dysfunction, um, the uh, uh, decreased activity, goes along with OCD, and so we call it a disease marker or a biomarker for OCD. Um, the other possibility is that the genes actually cause the orbital frontal cortex to already be overactive, and that overactive orbital frontal cortex, or sorry, underactive, the orbit, that, or, that underactive orbital frontal cortex doesn't immediately cause OCD, but rather it just brings a risk of OCD. And then that may or may not, because of some environmental factors or something else that we're not able to track in this study, um, it might lead to symptoms. And then in that case, our orbital frontal cortex dysfunction, since it goes along with risk rather than going along with the disease, orbital frontal cortex changes go along with risk rather than going along with the disease and the symptoms itself, um, we say that the orbital frontal dysfunction is a risk factor. This is something that we're definitely going to return to many times. So then they looked at healthy relatives versus patients with OCD versus controls, looking at fMRI uh, activity in the orbital frontal cortex during this task switching behavior. Um, and, um, and so our possible results, well, if it's a biomarker, then we expect our relatives to look like controls because, again, our invisible thing is genes are causing risk, and then only in some people does that risk manifest as, as orbital frontal cortex changes going along with symptoms. Um, and then if it's a risk factor, so that's our second theory, then the relatives will look like the patients because the genes cause the risk and OFC changes go along with risk, and then the symptoms in the disease may or may not manifest. Um, and so what they found is that, the, in fact, the relatives look like the patients. So then their interpretation is that it's a risk factor. Um, or increased orbital frontal cortex activity um, cause is, is, um, it goes along with the risk of compulsive urges. Um, and, more, and also the genetic factors um, cause risk and orbital frontal cortex changes, um, but actually don't cause the disease itself. And so then we can actually return back to the other part of the Chamberlain study, and we modify a little bit our conclusion there, where we say that actually um, this, um, uh, this, um, oh, uh, yeah, orbital cortex underactive during task switching um, puts people at risk for being able to stop, being unable to stop their compulsions rather than actually just guaranteeing that they can't stop their compulsions. So we have to modify slightly this. The next study that we looked at was this Welsh study looking at mice. Before we go into the details of that study, um, first of all, we talked about the basal ganglia in general, um, and in particular, one part of the basal ganglia called the striatum. Um, so the striatum gets excitatory glutamate input from the cortex, and then there are two types of cells in the striatum, one that directly project out, and when these cells are active, then they activate motor cortex and also turn on other parts of the cortex as well, and so they sort of... Um, encourage movement and encourage other kinds of behaviors. Um, and then um, when the, uh, and then other parts, um, uh, other cells in the striatum get input from the cortex as well that's excitatory. And when these cells are active, they suppress movement. So this is our direct projecting cells are our go pathway, and the indirect projecting cells are stop pathway. The Welsh study, um, we're going to return to sort of the, the cortex and, and basal ganglia um, in the second question of the Welsh study. But for the first question in the Welsh study, they just wanted to say, just wanted to figure out, does this particular gene, SAPAP3 mutation, cause OCD-like symptoms? And so um, 
there's a couple different theories that go along with. One is that SAFF3 mutations won't cause OCD symptoms, and the other one is that, uh, sorry, one is that uh, SAFF3 mutations does cause OCD symptoms, the other is that the SAFF3 mutations do not. And so their manipulation is they have some mice where they knock out or completely remove the SAFF3 gene and compare them to what are called wild type mice or mice that have just sort of normal genetic composition. And then what they're measuring is this grooming behavior. And so in terms of possible results, um, uh, so this is a little bit incomplete here, um, but the possible result A um, was so first, if the SAFF3 mutation causes OCD behavior, that's our theory A, then we expect more grooming because invisibly in the brain, there's some process going on where disrupting this gene causes disruption of brain connections. Um, and then if there's, um, if the SAFF3 mutation doesn't cause more breathing, then we expect no difference in behavior because SAFF3 mutation doesn't disrupt neural circuitry, at least not in a way that causes this particular behavior. And then the result is they see more grooming, and so their conclusion is SAFF3 removal causes these invisible changes in the brain that result in OCD-like behavior. Um, we'll talk about more with the Welch paper uh, in class this afternoon, um, but that's the main uh, stuff from, from class yesterday.